What are you seeing? Are you seeing the slides? Yes, we do see the slides. Okay, huh? very good. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so just, Thank uh, you. just go ahead. Okay, thanks very much to the organizers for um, giving me the honor to speak um, about uh, the topic of Lie algebras and infinite distance limits. This is work in progress with Songju Lee and Wolfgang Lerchi, but I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank my collaborators on related work um, for putting up with me um, in the past years. So um, also the context of this talk is the Swampland program, which Dieter just beautifully reviewed for us and which you all know uh, to be the question how to determine between the effective field theories consistent um, as QFTs, but not as quantum gravities, how to distinguish these from the landscape of fully consistent effective field theories coming from quantum, gra quantum gravity. And at this stage, I think it's appropriate to stress that this question is at the very center of the endeavor that we call string phenomenology, because this program combines reasoning about general principles of quantum gravity, such as black holes, disitter, enter disitter, with concrete investigations into the physics of string compactifications, with insights into the mathematics of string geometry, and all of this with the ultimate goal of informing or at least inspiring model building in particle physics and in cosmology. By now, there has been constructed an ever-grown web of um, swampland conjectures. This is just a small subweb, a little bit complementary to the beautiful web that we just heard about in the first talk. Um, this is a growing field, which you can see in particular in the um, um, a number of growing review articles. So for a much more complete account and references, please consult any of these wonderful review articles. And it's also a very good sign that many active young people, PhD students and um, postdocs work on this. And they have been giving wonderful talks on these and related questions in the String Fino summer series that has been organized in the past year, which I think was a great initiative, and also the Harvard Swampland seminar series. So please also ref, um, go to these two sources for, for, for more information. So let me just um, point out two representative arguments for why a theory could be in the Swampland. The first is that consistency of additional probe objects whose presence is enforced by quantum gravity constrains the original theory. This is something that um, is being uh, developed in various contexts to constrain, for example, theories in six dimensions on higher dimensional theories. And the second, and this is more to the spirit of this talk, is what Dieter just described before me, namely I, the idea that the cutoff in a quantum gravity theory can be much, much lower than naively thought. In particular, it can be much, much lower than the Planck scale if there is a light tower of state which becomes light on the boundaries of moduli space, for example, if G young mills goes to zero. So from a field theory perspective, this is unheard of, while, as we know, in quantum gravity, this is now nowadays considered the bread and, uh, bread and butter, so to speak, that namely, as we approach the boundaries of field space, if we go to infinite distance in moduli space, a tower of states becomes asymptotically light and, in fact, exponentially fast. Well, this is the content of the famous Swampland distance conjecture. I think it's fair to say that within string theory, this is um, almost proven, at least um, in all the regions where we look, in particular in the context of complex function moduli space of type 2b, um, which is in the context of um, uh, towers of 40 n equal 2 PPS states becoming light. There has been tremendous work on this. And this is also, again, just a small subset. And I'm sure we will hear much more um, about this in the course of this conference. And let me also point out interesting implications um, of this line of reasoning already for, for example, moduli stabilization and uh, questions of uh, flux vacuum. So the Swampton distance conjecture deals with the, uh, or predicts the appearance of this tower of states. But what it is a priori agnostic about is what the origin of this tower of states is at infinite distance, or relatedly what the actual physics is that we get to when we approach the asymptotic boundary. And this is an interesting question to ask because we know, for instance, from quantum field theory contexts that it's um, on the boundaries of moduli space, one can oftentimes um, uh, find interesting new structures, for instance, at finite distance in quantum field theory, uh, interesting new types of theories, strongly coupled theories arise. So it's equally interesting to ask, uh, um, ask this question in the context of quantum gravity, what happens at infinite distance, and if the infinite distance regime can still be 
described by an effective field theory, or if really new effects um, uh, turn up, like in finite distance in, um, in uh, quantum field theory. And um, this is attempted to be addressed by the emergent string conjecture, for example. This conjecture claims that um, if a quantum theory of gravity admits an infinite distance limit, then one of the following two must happen. Either it reduces to a weakly coupled string theory, possibly in a dual frame. In this case, we would get an infinite tower of string excitations along with Kaluza Klein tower at the same or slightly above, um, um, below scale. Or if not, then the theory decompactifies. So the tower of states should be an infinite tower of Kaluza Klein excitations, which we also heard about already in the previous talk. So the idea is here really, really to say that whenever we have these towers of, um, um, of um, um, a swampland distance states becoming light, it should, the, the towers should fall into one of the two classes. And this should give us a hint at what the physics at infinite distance really is. So this conjecture has so far been confirmed in many non-trivial, non-perturbative setups. And um, using knowledge about the string compactifications, it was, a, it, was, uh, it was possible to show that unless the theory really just decompactifies, um, one finds a unique emergent critical string, which plays the role of this weakly coupled string. And um, there were, this had many repercussions with studying the geometry of the string compactifications. Um, some contexts um, where th this has been looked in, in, into already is the Keller moduli space of F theory, M theory type to A in um, compactifications to six, five or four dimensions in uh, the context of 4D n equal to hypermultiplets where quantum corrections become very important in the context of M theory on G2 and also in the context of four dimensional n equal one compactifications to F theory where also quantum corrections become important. Interestingly, and independently of this, there is um, another conjecture which points to the importance of strings at infinite distance, the distance axionic string conjecture put forward um, by these colleagues here, who um, interpret every infinite distance limit as the um, RG flow endpoint towards an asymptotically tensional strings. And I think we will be hearing more about this um, also in the course of this conference. I think even today, Irina Sorg, if I'm not um, mistaken. In any event, let me point out that in my opinion, these two um, independent ideas are, um, uh, are compatible to the extent that in the emergent string conjecture, it's really the lightest string, um, which is in the focus of attention. Whereas the axonic string conjecture also refers to strings above the leading tower which nonetheless are important in order to um, show these observations about the RG flow. So in the interest of time, let me not go too much into detail about um, um, the possible sources of um, the strings, um, which one could find at infinite distance. The idea is that one way or another, either the original or a solid tonic string becomes weakly coupled. Um, and therefore light, and it will then be accompanied by Kaluza Klein modes. Or if this does not happen, the dual, the tower that one finds at infinite distance must have an interpretation one way or another as Kaluza Klein uh, states. And um, the um, uh, nice thing about the conjecture is that once we assume it, or once we show it in a particular region, um, we can deduce from it the weak gravity conjecture for um, the states associated with the tensionless string. And um, we try to make this more precise, uh, more recently in particular, also taking into account possible n equal one corrections in the four dimensional setup. Okay, so this ends my little review. And, and now I'd like to switch gears a little bit. As we've seen, uh, swamp and distance conjecture one way or another has been discussed in uh, various corners of the landscape for the closed string moduli, so be it um, complex structure or uh, Keller moduli, say type 2a or type 2b, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, our goal in this talk is to understand possible infinite distance limits in the quote unquote open string or brain moduli space. The naive expectation would be that the open string moduli space should be compact because this is the position of brains on a compact internal space or equivalently because we are talking now about Coulomb and Higgs branches of gauge theories. But this is really, of course, only true in strict perturbation theory. More generally, we know that um, there will be infinite distance directions, in particular, if we look at the problem um, in the context of seven brains in F theory, for us, 
today only compactified to eight dimensions for simplicity, then clearly these moduli are part of the complex structure moduli, which are famously known to have infinite distance directions. Once more, for type two compactifications on general Calabi-Yau and Calabi-Yau three and Calabi-Yau four, um, this moduli space of complex structures at infinite distance has been and is being studied um, with uh, a sample of some of the early papers um, just shown here. And um, similarly, we could now um, think about the algebraic geometry of K3 surfaces, but now interpreted as the space of F-theory compactifications and wonder about infinite distance limits. And in fact, it's known, it's well known and classic result that in such cases, the K3 degenerates to what's known a type two or type three Kulikov model, as I will also quickly review. But the point in my talk will be more about the nature of the towers and the physics of the limits and the idea um, if this interpretation of this tower of states that one finds is really um, um, of the type um, that uh, was conjectured in this string conjecture or not. So the main proposal is that the, op the brain moduli, but really we should be saying the complex structure moduli at infinite distance in, for F theory on K3 lead to the following possible types of degenerations. There could be either infinite distance enhancements, which lead to an enhancement of a Lie algebra G to a loop algebra hat G in affine algebra. This has most directly an interpretation as an infinite distance limit in the PQ seven brain moduli space, the non-perturbative brain moduli space. And it will be interpreted as indeed an effective dual decompactification limit, be it to, in this case, 10 or nine dimensions, because we are talking only about F theory and K3 for simplicity. Alternatively, the limits can be, not surprisingly, generalized recoupling limits. The special case of the familiar Zen limits is well known to all of us, which can then also be followed by a decompactification limit. But more generally, there can be so-called, what we call exceptional recoupling limits, which are emergent string limits and not of the Zen limit type, but nonetheless an emergent string limit. So um, I'd like to discuss this. Um, um, from three different points of view, from the point of view of PQ brains, from the point of view of the geometry of the K3, and um, from the point of view of a dual heterotic um, uh, setup. And to begin with, uh, I'll start with the PQ setup. So let me briefly remind us that um, seven brains in F-theory are PQ brains. These are the brains on which PQ strings can end. And of course, they induce a famous SL2Z monodromy as one encircles them. As is also well known to all of us is that uh, um, um, we can, we can um, uh, engineer the famous ADE um, gauge groups by stacking together um, various of such PQ brains. And in fact, for this, it suffices to consider a generating set of three PQ brains as has been discussed in great detail in the classic literature. What is also well known, but might not be on everybody's radar is that by an analysis monodromy alone, one can also, show that it's possible to enhance beyond ADE on, um, in, 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 uh, with PQ brains, namely to get affine enhancements from exceptional EN to an um, a, a affine extension. This was shown in a series of, paper of these, uh, papers of these authors. Indeed, they show that if we combine to an EN series another PQ brain of this type, then the monodromy around the entire system takes this upper triangular form. This has the property that it has an eigenstate of a one zero string essentially. Hence, we can encircle the setup with this extra string. This gives a BPS state, they show this. And clearly the BPS state becomes massless as these two string, as these two, um, the EN and the extra brain uh, come close together. So we get an enhancement, but the enhancement is not to um, a new uh, uh, Lie algebra, but to an affine algebra, namely this extra uh, PQ string delta here that uh, becomes masses in the limit, uh, plays the role of an imaginary root, precisely of the type to go from, from the E type Lie algebra to an affine extension there, which in this case, in fact, is a Kachmudi algebra. So this um, is a, a beautiful analysis based um, on monodromies alone by these authors. In this case, they classify the possible rank one enhancements, and they show that these are of the type where we can enhance from E6, 7, or 8 to the corresponding Kachmudi algebra, but also the entire E series, E5, and so on, up to E0 hat is possible. In the last case, we have no Lie algebra to start with, but nonetheless, we enhance. Um, they also discuss possible rank two enhancements. Um, there, 
by monogamy analysis alone, there are several options, but indeed, as we will see, um, only one of them is actually realized in F theory on K3, namely this is the enhancement from the f head E8 to the loop extension of head E8 by taking into account one extra brain. In this case, um, one finds two independent roots, delta one, delta two, which become massless as everything collapses. And uh, the resulting space is uh, the, the resulting group is then a loop, the, the, the loop um, algebra of hat E8. It's not a Kachmudi algebra anymore. So, unfortunately, we, it's not correct to talk about Kachmudi algebras in full generality, but we have to talk about loop algebras. In any case, this beautiful monodromy analysis does not address the following three questions. First, what's the physics? Second, which of these possibilities can occur? And how is all this realized on um, elliptic K3 in terms of the geometry? So let's first turn to the first question. From the um, imaginary roots that become massless, um, um, we find BPS states, this they already showed, from, um, and you can think of these as PQ strings encircling um, this entire conglomerate of, of brains. And in fact, and most importantly, we, go, we don't only get one state, but we get a full tower of them, because for every winding number n, the resulting junction is still BPS. This is because it squares to zero, so n times zero is still zero, which is the correct condition in this case. So from each subtype of, of junction, we become one BPS tower, one BPS tower per imaginary root. And the interpretation we'd like to give is that this is because these enhancements, um, the affine or loop algebra enhancements signal an infinite distance degeneration in the moduli space of, um, uh, in this case, PQ7 brains in F theory, namely when these seven brains come together. The BPS towers um, we interpret as KK modes associated to a dual compactification along S1 or S1 times S1. More precisely, if we have an affine series hat EN, so Kachmudi algebra EN, with just one um, such um, a BPS tower, N smaller than or equal to eight, this signals partially compactifications from eight to nine dimensions. And in the special case of the double loop algebra hat E9, so to speak, with two such towers, we have a full decompactification from eight to 10 dimensions. And in fact, this physical interpretation is backed up, among other things, by an analysis of the heteroidic dual, to which I will come um, in a bit. Before that, let's try to see how to make context, how to make content with the geometric um, uh, description of F theory on K3. So um, F theory on an elliptic vibration over P1 is as always for us um, uh, characterized by a Weierstrass model with these functions F and G of degree eight and 12 in the coordinates on the brain, um, on the uh, co coordinates on the base. The discriminant vanishes when we have a seven brain um, uh, localized, as we know, and of course, fa famously, the finite algebra enhancements are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the Kodaira Neron classification, and um, all. We, so this is a classification by the orders of vanishing of these functions f, g, and the discriminant delta. And all we need to know about this classification is that it stops, namely, it stops famously um, as soon as we um, uh, arrive at four, six, twelve, or above. So what happens? is that when we go to 4, 6, 12 or above at in co-dimension one, and this I must stress, then this is an example of a non-minimal, uh, an example of a non-minimal fiber leading to such an um, affine or more generally loop extension. Um, more precisely, if we um, uh, go to these non-minimal or non kodaira type fibers in co-dimension one, not co-dimension two, but co-dimension one, co-dimension two true, but the physics is different, then these, the resulting enhancements um, are known, well known in the literature to require a sequence of blow ups of the base. This leads to a degeneration of the space into a chain of intersecting compo components or more generally a graph of intersecting components, the Kulikov degenerations. And our point is now that one can read from these off very clearly which type of physics we have. Namely, if after the blow up, we have a DP9 component where the vanishing orders of F, G and delta away from the intersection section with the other components takes this form for six, 12 minus n, then we have an e hat nine minus n. And this, this means decompactification either to 10 or to nine dimensions. So this is to put it in a, um, in a single line. And of course, um, um, this needs to be now explained what is meant by this. So first of all, um, let me recall um, that the infinite distance degenerations in the complex structure modular space of K3 um, have been classified by mathematicians 
um, as situations where the K3 degenerates in a type two Kulikov model, it degenerates into a chain of different components, which importantly intersect over smooth tori of same complex structure. Um, in the type three case, we have a graph of multiple components which intersect over a rational curve or don't intersect at all. And once more, the claim now um, in this language is that if we have an enhancement to the double loop algebra hat E9, so this is compactification to 10, decompactification to 10 dimensions, then this means then this implies that after blow up, we have a type two Kulikov model. So this is something which we can check from the geometry. Whereas the enhancements of a single loop algebra or kutch moody type leads to a type three model after blow up. And this corresponds to a decompactification on S1. And in fact, this um, leads to a rich enhancement structure governing possible gauge algebras in nine dimensions. So in this way, we can think about F theory not only in uh, eight and even dimensions, but in this case also in nine dimensions, say, and um, hopefully then generalize, of course, also uh, to other cases. No, uh, this is your five minute warning. Thank you. Um, let me briefly show an example. So the example would be just for the sake of example of being concrete and a Bayeshras model with gauge algebra E7 and E8 to begin with. So we have at two points an E7 and an E8. And now we say in order to get these not, um, affine enhancements, we need to go beyond Kodaira's table. So we need to look at vanishing orders with 4, 6, 12 or above. And there are various ways of doing that. Um, I'm choosing here the way um, to take the coefficient C and D to zero. In this case, we can see that we get vanishing orders 4, 6 at T equals zero. So I introduce a corresponding parameterization with the parameter U that goes to zero. And it turns out that the behavior is now distinguished by the behavior of the remaining coefficients a and b. More precisely, if this combination does not vanish in the limit, we find a type 2 limit. This means um, decompactification to 10 dimensions with gauge group E8 times E8. This is the familiar stable degeneration limit, which we all know in, in detail. This is the full decompactification. But the rich structure appears if we start um, with degenerations for um, um, also of this combination with K bigger, um, bigger than one, then we enter the regime, the rich regime of type three limits, decompactification to nine dimensions with a variety of possible further enhancements. And here I'm listing the possible type of, Lee, of affine enhancements and then Lee groups to which this would correspond in nine dimensions. This is, of course, just for this particular example. So, for instance, um, if I start with the situation k equals zero, then I get um, a type two Kulikov model. This is where we just have a chain of different components. This is the stable degeneration limit, which is familiar to uh, um, uh, many of you. And um, um, in this case, the um, um, uh, the first and the last component are, of course, known to be DP nine surfaces. Um, and most importantly, um, we get an E9 enhancement from, from both of them. So we get uh, two towers of states, decompactification to 10 dimensions. And now the more new stuff is when we um, um, uh, look at the um, um, and at, at various other possibilities, for instance, um, for K equal one, one finds that this um, structure of these intersections of the curves changes according to the vanishing orders um, of these extra components. Um, um, in this case, um, one finds that the um, uh, uh, um, brains that are left on the DP9 surfaces correspond uh, precisely to the um, affine enhancements of E8. Uh, two brains have moved away from this branch, so to speak, and this would be a decompactification to nine dimensions with gauge group E8 times E8. And we can um, um, co continue this and uh, look at a, um, um, a a complete list of possibilities, um, encountering also all sorts of other types of um, maximal enhancements. So this is just an example. Um, let me, however, I chose it because in this case, the heterotic dual is well known. This is a list of uh, recent papers where the heterotic dual was considered, namely we can uh, we, we know that we can match the uh, Weierstrass functions, a, uh, the Weierstrass coefficients from our FG of the Weierstrass form um, into um, into dual um, uh, in, in, into uh, the so-called Siegel modular forms, which contain information about um, the complex structure, Kähler moduli and Wilson lines of the dual torus. And uh, we can now follow this dictionary in, in the degeneration limit and read off the vanishing behavior 
of or the, the behavior of the dual heterotic complex structure Keller modulus and Wilson lines. And in this way, we can confirm the claims that I made that in the uh, type two case in particular, we have a complete decompactification to 10 dimensions where only say the complex structure goes to infinity on the heterotic side and not the Keller moduli. Um, and in the remaining type three cases, we get the 9D limits. So this is just a glimpse of um, what backs up um, these arguments. Two quick notes and then I'm done. First, um, one can now use this to try and classify the maximal non-abelian gauge groups in nine dimensions, also via F-theory. This um, has been um, something that many of you um, have been working on in much more intricate contexts so far, uh, with uh, um, uh, asking much more intricate questions, but um, which can now also be uh, done in odd dimensions via F-theory. For example, you could uh, um, one can show that by monodromy and realization analysis, um, if the maximal non-abelian 9D series corresponds to these A and D series, which indeed agree with the classification precisely in nine dimensions um, via heterotic strings um, by these authors. And in order to get this pattern, it was really important to use the possibilities of, um, um, of um, these F-fine enhancements. And last but not least, this would require much more time, but um, just to mention it, there are also um, instances, and this is the second case, where the non codira fibra, fibers, once blown up, do not give rise to an affine enhancement, but rather to a special type of recoupling limit, a so-called exceptional recoupling limit. This is a recoupling limit in which the, um, uh, the, uh, the type 2b coupling goes to zero everywhere, except for point-like um, strongly coupled defects. So in this case, we have an emergent string limit and the um, uh, and, and one finds towers of, of string states and in addition KK states um, um, that accompany um, uh, this type of recoupling limit. Okay, um, so we've uh, proposed further evidence for the emergent string conjecture. Um, this had so far been addressed in, in the context of Keller moduli um, um, or closed moduli um, more generally. Um, in this talk, um, I, I, I was interested in open or brain moduli in eight-dimensional F-theory. Of course, this is really complex structure moduli. It makes no sense, this, this distinction between um, open and closed in, 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 in general in moduli space. And uh, we've seen two possible types of uh, degenerations, affine or loop algebra enhancements, which are dual decompactification limits, or uh, a new class of um, exceptional weak coupling limits, which are emergent string limits. So from a uh, F-theory point of view, this gives an in explicit interpretation for the non codira fibers appearing in co-dimension one. And from a Swamland point of view, this gives an in explicit interpretation of the BPS particle towers, um, at least in this class um, of um, um, uh, models looked at. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks Timo for a great talk. Uh, first question is from Aaron. Uh, hi, thanks so much for the uh, fascinating talk. Um, I have a question about whether, um, if when you say it's a decompactification limit, is that um, literally like in, as in a space-time dimension opening up, or are they towers of open string modes that should be interpreted as a dual interpretation to a space-time direction opening up? Uh, and if it, yeah, just and if if it is a space-time direction opening up then isn't that a mode of the metric, which is part of the closed string moduli space? Or very good, string, very good. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in what sense is that an open string infinite distance? Limit? Right, I think, it's, um, I think it's in a dual sense. So, in, uh, so, so here it's very easy in the, in, the, in the cases where we have a dual heterotic interpretation, there it's literally the, the, the torus directions, the two torus directions of the heterotic dual. So, but um, the point, um, and, th and this was the uh, point of this little exercise, which I couldn't really go into the details with. So we would match the, um, these more abstract open string junctions. These would be matched by the duality to the KK modes of the dual heterotic string. So in that, in that dual frame, it's, it's the usual decompactification. And um, right, so what, 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 what that, I found striking- that sense, Is that the only physical way to really understand this? Because F-theory doesn't have you know, the torus, the fiber is not a physical, there isn't a 12-dimensional 12, 12 theory, so. That's right, but it's not the, it's not the torus, it's not the torus of F-theory, it's the torus of the dual, in this case, heterotic theory. So for F-theory, right. now if I have a K3 vibration, it will be the torus of the dual uh, heterotic vibration. And then, of course, the interesting question, 
what, what if it's not a K3 vibration? Um, this, um, this, we will, this we will see. But um, the, the claim would be that there's always a dual, that's the claim, which might be wrong, but in this case was verified in others, we will have to see. The claim would be that there's always some dual frame where the states are literally the K, K mode. That's the, that's the claim. Okay, thank you. Okay, we, we have time from, uh, for a quick question from Wadi. Yeah, thanks very much, Timo. That was a fascinating talk. So yeah, really quick question. I've always assumed that when you go to the infinite distance limit where you go off the Kodaira table, like you go to E9 or something, that that was just outside the theory. Are you suggesting that basically every infinite distance limit of that type where you take a virus stress model and you go off the Kodaira table should have some decompactification interpretation? Not almost or the second type would be these exceptional recoupling uh, um, um, limits so so one of the two so one of the so, two so the really the so theory you, model life space should include all of the infinite yes distance. but of course they are they are at infinite distance so it's 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 right to say that if we want to stick in eight dimensions no 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 at infinite distance so in, in inside the moduli space we should not go to this go to this region but it's it's at infinite distance in the moduli space and it need not be decompactification those cases so, so here in these recoupling limits, it's like a recoupling limit where simply GS goes to zero, just that it's not a sign limit, both not technically and also not physically a sign limit, but it's a recoupling limit. So, yes. so in particular, you'd be saying that the space of theories includes paths that are infinite long, infinitely yes. long in distance. The space of yes. consistent theories. Fascinating. OK, Thank thanks a lot. I, OK, uh, thanks a lot for, for the very nice talk, Timo. Uh, Ralph, maybe you can maybe you can share your slides.